Welcome back to another episode of Palisade Radio. I am your host, Karema Mutlu. And on today's show, we have Don Lay, who is the president and CEO of Medallion Resources. Let's begin by talking about the rare earth metals market. The company that you're involved with got into the rare earth space nine years ago during the last rare earth boom. So talk to us about that. How quick was the run up and tell us what it was like to be in that boom back then. It's probably a great example of how sentiment can really drive a market in such a short space of time. Yes. Yeah, it, it certainly is. Um... At, at that point in time, I was uh, I wasn't involved in the company as a as an as a um, a principal or a, an executive at all. I I was a, a director and a significant shareholder. So the gentleman that was running the, the company at the time, the CEO, Dr. Bill Bird, he had had some experience in in rare earths, um, at, uh, having run Rare Element Resources, a significant significant exploration company, rare earth exploration company. For a number of years, and so he knew the market quite well. And what kind of happened was um, uh, Jim Dines, the newsletter writer, wrote wrote up Rare Earths in in May of 2009, and sort of triggered a bit of a, a buying frenzy because uh, up to that point in time, there hadn't been much interest in them. People were looking for new investment ideas, and he kind of exposed Rare Earths to the general marketplace, and. Um, uh, and what he really did was he kind of put a uh, an interesting political spin on it or a geopolitical spin on it where um, pointing out how China controlled rare earths, how they were strategic and important and, and China was using them for industrial advantage or part of industrial policy in effect and that the world, the rest of the world was going to need more of rare earths and they better start exploring to them because prices were probably heading up and heading up dramatically. So we put this out in May of 2009 and he wrote up three companies in rare earths and they all, they all moved up smartly on, on his recommendation. At that point in time, uh, Dr. Bird suggested that maybe Medallion start looking at rare earths because he had a good background in it. He had ideas about which properties to, to go after. And, uh, that's really kind of, he recommended that to the board that we do that. And Medallion was, was in effect a trading shell at the time, previously a, a precious metal explorer. And, uh, the board gave him permission to go forward with that business plan. And we've been in the rare earth business in the business every, ever since now, subsequent to, to that, we, uh, the, the boom really lasted kind of 2010, um, kicked off in 2009, but the boom really was sort of 2010 through 2012. And, uh, it went from in North America, there would have been maybe four, four companies involved in rare earths at that point in time, listed companies Two two and a half years later, there would have been, 200 companies that were chasing rare earths in North America, listed companies in North America, plus another, say, 100 in Australia as well. So, yeah, so it was uh, it was quite heady times. The, the the price of rare earths, many of the rare earths went up, went up fivefold, eightfold. Some of them went up by 20 fold during during that during that peak. And uh, uh, people people started paying attention to light rare earths versus heavy rare earths, the growth of the marketplace, the control of China. And um, billions and billions of dollars was invested in, in the space, um, much into exploration companies, but also a significant amount of capital went into uh, two companies that both got into production, one of which went bankrupt. So that would, would be Linus, the Australian company, and Molly Corp, the American company. Um, we've kind of come full circle, though, and there was the subsequent bear market in, in rares. So that's kind of the snapshot of, of the day, if you will. Very good. Okay, well, let's move on to the challenges facing the rare earth market today. What are your current thoughts regarding China and how important are they for this market, especially in regards to an ongoing trade dispute with the US? Yeah, so China China um, still controls the vast majority of the rare earths. The, the market is maybe 50% larger by volume, about 150 or 60,000 tons per year, of which China would produce and process about 80% of the rare earths. Um, Linus, the Australian company, is the only significant uh, rare earth producer outside of China. They would do about uh, 22,000 tons, tons a year. And China really, as I mentioned, controls the processing of rare earths. So it would control, the, uh, uh, in fact, it controls so much of the processing, it actually Im imports ore from outside China for processing. It does that from Molly Corp. <laughs> 
or MP Materials, as it's called now, which is the Mountain Pass Mine in California that Molycorp used to run. Yeah, so in, rare earth processing is complex. Um, the, people like to say, well, rare earths aren't really that rare. And in fact, in the earth's crust, they're not really that rare. Although it is, an, it is um, difficult to find them in, in economic quantities, just the way they happen to be distributed in the, um, in, in the earth's crust. So China still control, controls that market. And it really, though, China's not fussed about rare earths themselves. Rare earths are, are important for China because rare earths go into electronics, automobiles, defense equipment in very small amounts, typically uh, wind turbines in large amounts. But it goes into all of these, all of these very important and strategic uh, slices of the manufacturing economy that it seeks to dominate. So rare earth itself as a marketplace at the oxide level, which is how it's traded and counted, is about a $5 billion a year market. Strategic importance, they're, they're huge because there's literally trillions of dollars of manufactured and produced goods that rare earths go into. That's the important part. And because it controls the access to those rare earths by managing the bulk of the value chain, it can also control where people manufacture their, their, the products that use those rare earths. And that's what's important to China. It's really the, the domination of the um, industrial uh, value chain. And they, they've got their own uh, strategic plan called Made in China 2025, which is all about how to dominate the world's manufacturing uh, economy. And uh, rare earths are a key part of that strategy. Let's shift towards the growing adoption towards electric vehicles and the magnet metals that are needed for them. Where, in your view, Don, are we within the EV industry today? More and more news stories are coming out regarding joint ventures with competing car companies and battery makers, all trying to stay ahead for this new shift in the vehicle industry. So what are your views on where we are in the adoption rate for EVs? And then talk to us about the need for magnet metals within this new industry. Yeah, so so you know, I think one of the, one of the uh, as I'm sure you folks have known because you've been on top of it. There's the battery metals are have been uh, have gotten a significant amount of attention the last uh, uh, two years, in particular um, lithium and cobalt, but you know also nickel and graphite as well. Um, those are important markets for the batteries. When people think about electric vehicles. They, they think first about the battery, and the battery is, is critical to it, especially given the size and the weight of the battery. It's a significant amount of materials uh, it is, is used for, 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 the, for produ production of those batteries, and the EV marketplace hadn't scaled up for that production. So uh, that, that's something that's been out there. Now, what's happened recently, of course, is the battery, some of the battery uh, material have sold off, but... I think what, what is really clear, if you look at the adoption rates of electric vehicles, both when they're subsidized and they're not, and you also look at the, the, um, where the economics uh, uh, settle in, it's, it's very clear that whether it's pure electric vehicles or hybrid electric vehicles, and those could be plug-in hybrids or, or Prius-style hybrids where they're not plug-in, uh, that, that, that marketplace it, it is growing very quickly. and. Um, is going to be reaching an inflection point of mass adoption, especially in urbanized settings. So uh, certainly a, somebody that drives an F-150 in Montana and has to drive uh, hundreds of miles a day and, and, and do rough work isn't, isn't fussed about electric vehicles and won't be for quite a few years. But in urban environments, particularly the fast-growing Asian urban, where the government is quite keen to, to cut down on the pollution as well, electrification makes a ton of sense. And we're going, to, we're going to see more and more electric vehicles of all sorts, shapes and sizes uh, emerging. Um, without a doubt, the Chinese will play a big role in that. But as you've stated, and what is the significant investment that um, the likes of Toyota and uh, VW um, are putting into, into electric vehicles and elect electrification of vehicles themselves in terms of building those um, platforms that they can sell to other companies as well, and that 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 there is no slowing down this train. So we're in for, a, in for a, I, I think, a period of growth over the next 10 years, which is going to be exceptional for electric vehicles and, um, uh, and hybrid vehicles, of which I'm not too fussed about it. 
There's certainly big advantages in the hybrids as well. For example, a, a, a friend of mine has a has a hybrid vehicle. Um, they only drive it about, uh, she drives it about 15 kilometers to work and back every day. It's got a range of about 40. She plugs it in every night. She's had the car a year. She's only put gasoline in it three times in the year. And uh, electricity is quite cheap here in Vancouver. So it's costing her virtually nothing to drive the car, which, it, which is amazing. So yeah, we see electric vehicles and hybrid vehicles require rare earth in the magnets in the motors. And that's sort of one of the missing elements that people have missed out on on uh, on uh, uh, the electrification trend is that's the missing commodity. So NDPR or neodymium and praseodymium magnets, rare earth magnets are critical for light weighting of motors in electric vehicles. The example I like to use is the is the Chevy Bolt, which the electric motor weighs 38 kilograms so 80 pounds. And that's the electric motor that powers the entire car. Um, batteries are heavy. But electric motors are very are are very light and light weighted, as well as all the other electric motors in the car. So the one that if even if you drive an internal combustion engine car, your your uh, air conditioner and your water pump are driven by electric motors now. They're not driven off of um, off of uh, the crankshaft of the of the car. So there's uh, hundreds of electric motors inside of, uh, of a Mercedes, for example, and all of those have neodymium and praseodymium in them, and that trend is increasing. So it's very it's very uh, very exciting to to have rare earths as part of the uh, electric vehicle boom, and about ninety percent of the economics or eighty percent of the economics in, in the rare earths are now driven by by magnets by the magnet space and most of that by uh, uh, electric motors. So yeah, it's uh, inter- interesting uh, interesting uh, spot we find ourselves in here, and I think it bodes well for the reemergence of 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 the rare earth sector. Let's move on and talk a bit more detail about the boom and bust cycles, not only within rare earths, but for the mining industry in general. In your experience of past cycles, what lessons have you learned, Don, as an investor, but as also as a CEO? The cyclical nature of mining really needs to be used as an advantage if an investor has any chance of making any meaningful gains. So can you share your experience with us? And have there been any books or specific authors that have helped guide you as an investor within the resource space? Yeah, so I, I, I mean, I guess the the one thing is that you know, as a both of an investor and and running a company, what what one tends to find is in the in the cycles of 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 resource stocks, because of the long lead time in getting projects developed and ready ready for ap- actual capital expansion, uh, it's important from the company standpoint to take a bit of a measured approach, and sometimes the market starves the companies of because of this long lead and lag time, the companies get starved of capital when they need it. And at other points in time, the markets in the boom times, the market's throwing money at the companies and wants them to go fast and go as fast as you possibly can to capture the, the, uh, the economics, if you will, be first to market place or get all the rich margins when materials are higher priced and that sort of thing. And, you know, it takes nine months for a woman to have a baby and it takes a certain amount of time to develop a miner or, or, or get something into production. And um, rushing it usually doesn't end, doesn't end well. And Molly Corp is, a, is probably the best example of that. It, it put in the uh, Mountain Pass mine in California into production. Uh, it is without a doubt, you know, a premier um, rare earth deposit, uh, probably it, along with uh, Linus Mount Well deposit are the probably the two best uh, hard rock rare earth deposits outside of China, and um, and Linus is now very successful and in production and and uh, Mountain Pass or MP Materials as it's called now, uh, Mollycorp, which was the pre- predecessor company went into bankruptcy and and now uh, uh, and and had two billion dollars of capital to to that that it expended in getting into production. But the prices went down and went down fast, and and it and, and couldn't make it into 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 commercial successful commercial production. Anyways, it, it did get into production, and didn't do that. So really, a, a measured approach from the investors' standpoint, watching the longer term trends and paying attention to the to those trends. I think pressing your advantage when when you've got it is an is an important um, thing. In terms of investors, I listen to Jimmy Rogers from a macro 
macro perspective. Uh, he's out of Singapore. He used to be George Soros's partner. I also li- listened to Rick Rule and uh, Marin Katuza and uh, many of the, many of the others that um, that are sort of well known in, in the resource space. Um, Hedgeye is a is a, a website I go to and sort of to, to catch up what macro is. Um, yeah, so I try to try to really. Uh, listen to a lot of different voices and not ones that are just in my space and not and not necessarily just talking a book uh so those are all critical critical sort of parts of it and um um and also listen to listen to voices that have that are in opposition to what you're invested in or what you believe just to just to make sure that your your thinking is is still sound okay don so give us an update on what you guys are doing at Medallion Resources and the strategies you have involved for perhaps the coming rare earth boom. Yes, so Medallion's got a bit of a different approach. We, we initially started looking at properties in, uh, in rare earth and explored a few properties, but uh, about eight years ago decided that the best way to get to rare earth production, in our view, outside of China was by processing byproduct materials. So there's a, a couple of avenues one can take. We pursued heavy mineral sands, which is is a mining industry that mines beach sands around the world for the titanium and zircon. And as they do that, they they also mine and upgrade a monazite, which is a, a byproduct mineral. And that that mineral is rich in rare earths. So we've been we've been working on a business plan and the process development to get to 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 produce um, uh, a rare earth concentrate from byproduct monazite because it's byproduct. It's it's cheaper to acquire process there's some tricky things involved because of the radioactivity associated with with all with monazite and all rare earth ores but we were making terrific progress in getting that and monazite happens to be rich in ndpr which of course is in demand by the um, by the uh, uh, automobile automobile makers for the um, uh, electric vehicles so we think this is a terrific part of the business to be in and we look to get into production first in north america excellent okay as we begin to wrap up here don uh, anything else on your mind you know, the, the one thing is something I, I had missed you, that you had asked me asked me about, which was about the trade tension here, and in rare earths area. And um, to the beginning of May, the rare earths again hit hit the media for the first time uh, in a big way in quite a, quite a while, and that was because uh, President Xi in China had visited a, a rare earth magnet factory in China, and uh, brought along a Xinhua, the state um, media company as well as his as, as well as his trade minister and um, so he sort of intentionally did this to light up a, a storm in the trade side of it so china has played a card in the rare earth space uh to um to to show that it's got powers and it it would be prepared to use them the one thing is i have to tell you is that uh, the Americans, uh, government, uh, Commerce Department, Department of Def- Defense, Department of Energy, um, are all very concerned about rare earth production and um, are keen to help the U.S. develop its own value chain in rare earths. And that th- those there's a number of initiatives underway that we're gonna we're gonna be uh, seeing, I believe, rolled out that are gonna support that. And I think that's a smart idea. Uh, it's important. It's important strategically, and it's important as well for the. Um, the development of the electrification trend that we're seeing here, that there be significant amount of rare is produced outside of China. So China controls it now, but um, the future is changing and we'd like to play a, a, a big role in that. Well, thank you very much for your time today, Don. Much appreciated. My pleasure. Thanks so much. think you understand the junior mining sector and you think that the participants in the mining sector, junior mining sector, are good people and kind people, hit the bit. How violent that term could be, it actually could be quite violent. Uh, It could be a rip your face off uh, uranium rally. And the world is always going to need raw material. It's going to need copper and gold and nickel and so forth. Totally destabilized. Hey, hey, troll, did you hear what's going on in Yemen?